The Subcommittee on Employment and Workplace Safety will come to order. Uh, today's hearing is going to explore how we can strategically build our critical minerals workforce. Uh, my co-chair, Ranking Member Braun, and I will each give an opening statement, then we'll introduce the witnesses. Um, and after the witnesses give their testimony, senators will have five minutes to uh, ask a round of questions. Last month, the subcommittee convened a hearing about the importance of health and safety in the overall mining industry, and our witnesses talked about America's mining history and, and practices we can adopt to uh, enhance the safety of our workers today and going into the future. Uh, today, we're going to dig deeper into the future, uh, talk about how to build the critical minerals workforce that our country is going to depend on for decades to come, I think it's fair to say. Uh, right now, America is in the middle of a great transition to a clean economy. Uh, but to reach full energy independence, we're going to need to, to build faster and to build smarter. Uh, to power the transition, we're going to need critical, critical minerals just as we do the transition, and, and we're going to need a lot of them. Uh, according to the International Energy Agency, mineral demand could double by 2030 and quadruple by 2040. Those are sobering statistics, to say the least. Globally, globally, we don't have nearly enough of some of these minerals, but even for the minerals we do have, processing facilities are controlled by a relatively small number of countries. Not all of them uh, are allied with our values. And we, even if they were all our friends, we end up with bottlenecks in supply uh, and, and the resulting geopolitical competition. Uh, as mineral demand rises, uh, I think we're going to see that vulnerability increase as foreign actors try to insert themselves into uh, our supply chain, uh, manipulate prices for their own benefit. Uh, I think China has made it clear that they are aggressive in, in this type of role, uh, especially as in terms of uh, processing minerals that uh, would be crucial for our national and, and for our energy security. Uh, as a couple of examples, China dominates 70% of rare earth element production, 90% of the processing. Um, these minerals are crucial for wind turbines, for electric vehicles, um, missile systems. I, I could go on. It's a long list, as you all know. Uh, to meet our clean energy goals, reduce our dependence on China, we need to increase domestic uh, production and processing of critical minerals and strengthen our alliance our alliances with international partners. Uh, preparing for this new wave of domestic minerals production is its a little bit like a jigsaw puzzle. Uh, all the right places have to get in the right place at the right time uh, if this is really going to work. Uh, a key piece of the puzzle is recruiting and training uh, and making sure you can retain a robust, talented, diverse, resilient uh, workforce that can uh, address critical minerals. Uh, it's estimated that the critical minerals workforce will need double over the next five years to just to meet the, the needs we now project. Uh, but instead of the workforce growing, what we've seen in the last couple of years is a, a decline. Uh, and over a longer term, uh, we've seen a decrease of, of uh, roughly 40% uh, over the last 30 years. Uh, many workers are retiring as that average age got older and older. Uh, some have moved into other industries. Uh, I think even more concerning, our, our talent pipelines are not in shape. They're not, they're not fit uh, to be able to deliver the, the number of skilled workers we need and, and, and the workers having the, making sure the workers have the right skills. While China is graduating, literally thousands of students from mining-related programs every year, the U.S. has only about 600 students over total enrollment right now. Uh, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, we'll need at least 70,000 more craftsmen to build out these work sites. Uh, we'll also need surveying, mapping technicians to make sure that we can find the, the mineral deposits. Uh, we're going to need upskilling and reskilling our workforce to meet the diverse demands that this is all going to require, uh, for, especially for all these workforce slots. Um, and a, a lot of this is 
has got to happen in rural communities. There are certainly some bright lights uh, in our state of Colorado. Uh, the Colorado School of Mines is a leader in the way, in how you go about training engineers and chemical processors and, and geologists. Uh, as, a, as a recovering geologist myself, I'm sensitive to the challenge involved in that educating process. Uh, unions like the United Steelworkers and International Union of Operating Engineers are offering apprenticeship and other training opportunities to train uh, not just engineers, but construction workers and heavy equipment operators, uh, equipment servicers. This is all a great start, but we need to build and expand these programs and we need to learn and work from our international partners like, like Australia and Canada that have maintained uh, uh, their energy in, in this regard over these last few decades when we have maybe backed off. Uh, in many ways, they are ahead of the game in training this next, general, next generation of crucial mineral workforce. So it's time to get building. Today we're going to let, get to hear from a panel of experts as we begin to craft a blueprint uh, to expand critical minerals workforce. Uh, I want to thank my co-chair, Senator Braun, and his staff for working with us to host this hearing. And uh, before I hand it off to Senator Braun for his opening, I want to submit uh, two statements for the record. Uh, the first statement is from the United Steelworkers Union. The other is from MP Materials, a Colorado-based company in support of today's hearing. Uh, with that, I'll recognize Ranking Member Braun for his opening statement uh, and, and to also introduce our first, first witness. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Critical minerals have been regarded as the building blocks of U.S. economic and national security. The physical and chemical traits of these unique materials allow them to be applied to advanced technologies that can benefit our nation in many ways. Strengthening America's critical minerals helps to reduce our reliance on getting these materials from adversarial countries. And it seems to be a lot of that at play currently. Additionally, our critical mineral supply chain is an important issue for strengthening American manufacturing and keeping jobs here in the U.S as part of a, a connected supply chain. Strength of America's critical minerals largely depends on the strength of the workforce. And in so many different places in our country, the workforce just has not stayed up with the demand. So much of that has to do with uh, how we educate kids and advise them when they're in high school. Uh, this should be starting in middle school. And a lot of the programs that would have prepared kids for this have been disbanded and we don't have the guidance systems, we don't have higher ed working together, especially through transparency on what these high demand, high wage jobs are. Uh, to me that is simple and for too long we've kind of just hid behind a system that's not doing it well in many arenas, not just critical minerals. This leads us into the issue of improving that workforce development. As with many industries facing shortages, we're trying to still find that right mix. In my own state of Indiana, which is the biggest manufacturing state per capita, we've been talking about it for years. When I was in our state legislature back seven, eight years ago, we had 15, 20 different programs spending a billion dollars a year not quite getting it right in my own built a business in my hometown and county, found out our school systems were stigmatizing against pathways like this. Very simple, high demand, high wage jobs, put it out there. Know what the career pay is gonna be, what starting pay is, and what educational costs are gonna be associated with it. It's imperative that young people understand this along with their parents or else we will miss opportunities. Uh, the way to drive home this message is to make sure uh, our kids and their parents have full information and transparency. So we're going to talk about it particularly today on critical minerals. I get the uh, opportunity here to introduce our first witness, uh, Dr. Barbara Arnold, who is a professor of practice in mining engineering at uh, the Penn State um, which I won't get into our competition with Indiana University and Purdue with Penn State. Let's stay on a pleasant subject here. Uh, 
Dr. Arnold has over 30 years of experience in the coal and mineral industries, and over 20 years she represented several coal and mineral processing equipment companies in the U.S. and consulted with coal companies and engineering contractors to develop flow sheets for new coal preparation plants and plant retrofits. She is a recognized international expert in coal preparation, and we welcome her expertise to this panel. Thank you for being here. Yield back. Well, I think, Dr. Arnold, you're welcome to your opening statement. Thank you. Senators, staff, and guests, good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to address you on a matter of utmost urgency the need to expand our critical minerals workforce. My name is Barbara Arnold, a professor of practice and chair of the mining engineering program at the Pennsylvania State University. I teach and conduct research on mine health and safety focused on respirable dust and critical minerals, assessing the domestic critical mineral resources, especially in Appalachia. The National Academies hosted a workshop in late January 2024 supported by the United States Geological Survey titled Building Capacity for the U.S. Mineral Resources Workforce. The workshop report was recently published. Let me quote from that report. The 14 mining engineering programs across the United States collectively graduated only 162 students in 2023 falling far short of the estimated employment demand for 400 to 600 mining engineering graduates per year in the United States. By contrast, China's 45 mining engineering programs currently enroll about 12,000 students and graduate approximately 3,000 annually, about 16 times the number of graduates in the U.S. One might think that the need for critical minerals in a stable domestic supply would encourage increased enrollment in our mining engineering programs. But let me quote the NASM report again. A key concern expressed by several participants is that negative public perceptions of mining can dissuade students from considering a career in minerals extraction. For many, the minerals industry is linked with a legacy of environmental damage, which has been reinforced by negative depictions of the industry and popular culture. To begin to overcome this perception, several participants suggested focusing on reframing the industry as being part of the solution to environmental issues. Improving awareness of the role of mining in addressing climate change and environmental degradation could help to attract students who are passionate about the environment. The mining industry itself is moving towards a digital and autonomous future. We incorporate digital twins to optimize mining and mineral processing technology. We fly drones to monitor tailings, do aerial surveys of stockpiles and collect water samples. Autonomous haul trucks and trains move materials with automation and control technologies becoming increasingly sophisticated. The Society for Mining, Metallurgy, and Exploration, the lead U.S.-based mining professional society, is focused on workforce development. Their Ph.D. fellowship and career grant program helped address faculty shortages, along with research funding for capacity building from the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health. Those of us at the U.S. mining schools are revamping our curricula to incorporate this ever-changing landscape. At Penn State, we've added courses on automation and control and sustainability. Despite these efforts, we still need help attracting more students into our programs. In spring 2023, we graduated only four students with bachelor's degrees in mining engineering at Penn State. They're all employed with an average salary of $75,000. Our program should be attracting more students. In the QS University rankings, our Penn State mining engineering program is ranked second in the U.S. and 13th globally, up from 17th last year. So we should be attracting talent. Incoming students just don't know that mining exists. To address this, we're offering our first ever Mining Rocks Penn State Summer Mining Camp in August. Free of charge to the first 20 students, thanks to support of our alumni and mining industry partners. During the NASA workshop, several other actions were suggested. One specific in, uh, piece of, uh, of suggestion was to make sure that the K-12 curriculum incorporates the significance of minerals in our daily lives. For example, there are 62 different elements in a cell phone, all sourced from mining. Electric vehicles require much more copper and other critical minerals than conventional cars. Wind turbines and solar panels all require critical minerals. The 2021 report by the International Energy Agency titled The Role of Critical Minerals in Clean Energy Transitions 
say, says that mineral demand will increase by about four times by 2040 to meet climate goals. Where will the minerals come from? Who will mine the minerals safely and responsibly? Everyone must understand that if it can't be grown, it has to be mined. Miners play a crucial role in our society. They provide fertilizers and the metal for farm implements. They provide metals for trucks and the catalysts for catalytic converters in those trucks to reduce pollution. And they provide all the critical minerals in our increasingly high-tech everyday lives. Let's take a moment to appreciate their hard work and dedication. Thank a miner every day. Thank you for allowing me to discuss the critical mineral workforce with you today. Thank you, Dr. Arnold. Um, I'll, I will make sure I thank a miner today um, and, and future days. Um, uh, now I'm happy to introduce our next guest, uh, Dr. Gracelyn Baskerin. Dr. Baskerin is the director of the Project on Critical Mineral Security at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Uh, Dr. Baskerin has garnered experience studying international and domestic critical minerals production uh, and regularly offers her expertise at universities and policy forum, forums of all sizes and all shapes. Anyway, Dr. Baskerin. Chairman Hickenlooper, Ranking Member Braun, and distinguished members, thank you so much for having me. I'm honored to share my views on this topic today. Um, I'd like to reflect a bit on how workforce has become an impediment to reducing our reliance on China, both domestically and internationally. Um, by way of introduction, and I think it's a little bit of a background, is I started in the mining industry 11 years ago through a Fulbright Fellowship from the U.S. State Department, and they very kindly dropped me into South Africa's platinum belt, which was a bit of a which was a bit of a culture shock um, at the time. But I really saw the long-term value of the sector, both economically and technologically, acknowledging how, for example, the the vehicle the automotive industry was changing. I grew up in Metro Detroit. And my career, which has taken me from the depths of the mines in South Africa through a PhD into the halls of Washington, began with a Fulbright. And that frames some of my recommendations that I would put forth about how we can actually make existing mechanisms better fit for purpose. Um, Dr. Arnold did a great job. I don't need to go too far down the numbers again, but we know that the Chinese education system, which has over 38 minerals processing schools and over 44 mine engineering program, um, has really enabled them to build this dominant hold they have both on production and processing globally. Um, Central South University, uh, China's biggest program, graduate about 100, has 1,000 undergraduates and 500 graduates alone ready to build that. When China uh, cut off our uh, rare earth processing technology exports, it really struck us what a shortfall that we have in the knowledge to deploy that technology. Um, a report published by the U.S. Department of Interior noted that the mining industry is having difficulty attracting young professionals. I always say if there's two industries that are not attractive for the youth, it's at being a farmer and being a miner. And there's two things, again, I think Dr. Arnold hit really well. One is understanding it's tech-based now. We're not in an era of, you know, picks and wheelbarrows. We're really in an era of, like, what is, essentially resembles a... a NASA control room if you've spent a lot of time at new modern mines. And the second is that mining is far more responsible than it was two decades ago. And as such, it doesn't have that negative connotation. So there's three strategies that I would quickly propose. So the first is to create a dedicated Fulbright program for the mining industry. Right now we have the Fulbright Arctic Initiative, Fulbright Haze for, for school age um, uh, educators and administrators. We have a Fulbright program for people building expertise in Europe. Uh, we have another one for artists. But a Fulbright program that does two things. It takes STEM graduates from the United States and sends them to programs. We have four of the top 12 mining programs in the world are in Canada, four in Australia, there's one in Saudi. It opens up potential to send our STEM graduates abroad, but it also gives us potential to bring faculty from abroad to the United States to help build mining programs in geology programs. I grew up in a world of geology. My dad is a geology professor. And he said, you know, it's just mining has just never been a presence and we need to bring that expertise to our geology environmental science program. Second one, I'm sure we'll come back to you, is increasing NSF, National Science Foundation funding. The National Science Foundation has 15 focus areas. Chemicals and materials is perhaps the closest to mining, but it's still largely absent. And if you look at the active grant opportunities from the NSF, just nine out of 815 of them are for mining, which is about 1.1%. The third mechanism under there 
is actually expanding the Infrastructure Investment Jobs Act. Right now, there's provisions to expand energy jobs, but expanding energy advisory work to mining to open up those jobs actually lets us ensure that we have the feedstock needed to produce the very renewable energy technology that we set out to build. The second bucket is, say, collaboration between mining uh, companies and universities. There's a lot of scope. We have a lot of, of expertise in the private sector. But opening up scholarships, which we can come back to as being a best practice elsewhere. Anglo-American, for example, has funded a significant amount of the mining expertise built in South Africa over the years by putting in the bursaries and the graduates go back and work for them afterward. There's mechanisms that are budget neutral in that way that we can support. And finally, we need to leverage our US military academies. If we go back and look, um, many of our academy trained engineers built the railroads and bridges for westward expansion, and they were instrumental in the industrial re re revolution. It's really time we have a national security challenge on our hand to leverage those institutions. There are only two American CEOs of mining majors. One is Richard Askin at Freeport. The other is Bob Will at Modin. And Bob was an Alcoa executive for many years. And then is now, after doing his uh, career with the Army, he's now leading uh, one of the fastest growing mining companies in the world built on that expertise. At CSIS, we're now planning our first national security and critical mineral summit to help fill that gap. So I think it's a multi it's a multi-dimensional challenge. I think we have the solutions at hand at the United States, and I look forward to discussing more how we can do that. Great, <clears throat> great. Thank you, Dr. Vaskarin. Uh, next, we'll have uh, Mr. John Evans. Uh, Mr. Evans is the president and CEO of Lithium Americas, uh, is building a which is building a lithium mine and and chemical facility in northern Nevada. John's been with the company since 2017, but he has 20, over 20 years uh, experience in operating and managing various businesses, including running FMC Corporation's Lithium Division. Mr. Evans. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Chairman Hickenlooper, Ranking Member Braun, and members of the committee, my name is John Evans. I'm the President and CEO of Lithium Americas Corporation. I greatly appreciate your focus on workforce development for critical de minerals development. Finding the skilled workforce for my project and industry needs to thrive is a significant challenge, and I commend you for working to address this important issue. Lithium Americas is building a major lithium mine and processing facility in northern Nevada called the Thacker Pass Project. We've been working on Thacker Pass for more than a decade and are pleased to be fully permitted and funded to move forward with this essential project. Once in operation in 2027, we'll produce enough refined lithium carbonate for approximately 800,000 electric vehicle batteries per year. That's a market improvement on the U.S.'s ability to provide materials we need. To start, the project will offtake will be sold exclusively to General Motors. This will profoundly as assist uh, GM with their transition to electric vehicles. Workforce development is a challenge that we're trying to meet head on. Lithium Americas will utilize as many as 2,000 skilled workers to build Thacker Pass. Uh, to ensure we get the workers we need in a remote area of Nevada, we've entered into a project labor agreement with the North American Building Trades Union. NATBU knows how to recruit and train local and regional professionals to build large-scale projects like ours and to get the job done right. Once completed, Lithium Americas will employ roughly 350 full-time professionals at our Thacker Pass facility. These jobs will operate sophisticated processing and chemical manufacturing plants, and the workers will, uh, we need are not readily available. I'll add that the average wage uh, with benefits and wages is $100,000 a year. To meet the need, we have embarked on aggressive efforts working with the University of Na Nevada, Great Basin College in Nevada, the state of Nevada, and, and others to implement the training we need so our future workforce is ready to go once Thacker Pass is complete in 2027. Lithium Americas is committed to doing this project right. This includes sound environmental stewardship, ensuring the benefits of our project accrue to local communities, including the Fort McDermott Paiute Shoshone Tribe, and providing family supporting careers in this exciting and emerging battery industry. Because of the significance of our project and being an industry leader from the start, Lithium Americas has been committed to engaging with local community and tribal members. This active dialogue has allowed Lithium Americas to be transparent about the project's details and its impacts. Lithium Americas has participated in numerous open houses, community meetings, one-on-one -on -one dialogues, provided numerous tours, and emphasized employment opportunities and other ways the project could benefit local and tribal members. Over the past several years, many throughout Humboldt County have expressed interest in working on site, participated in job skills training coordinated or provided by our company as well. Numerous members of the tribe have emphasized that this project allows members to stay home or return home because of the jobs we will provide. Lithium Americas and the Fort McDermott tribe have a formal community benefits agreement founded on years of active engagement. It focuses on ensuring the tribe can benefit from the job creation at Thacker Pass by committing to additional job training and employment opportunities for tribal members, as well as providing infrastructure development and support for cultural education and preservation. 
Both the Americas has agreed to build a $5 million community center for the tribe that includes a preschool and daycare so parents will be able to take advantage of the jobs we'll create while knowing their kids are safe and secure. Lorena Bell, Fort McDermott's tribal chairwoman, commented on the announcement of the Department of Energy's loan that will help finance construction of the project that Thacker Pass will provide important economic and environmental opportunities, uh, employment opportunities for our members of our tribe. In the nearby town of Oravada, Lithium Americas is committed to building a new K-8 public school. A leading motivator for this community investment is to ensure prosperity at, uh, at Thacker Pass benefits many generations of locals starting in elementary school and potentially continuing through lifetime quality careers mm -hmm. in the area. Lithium Americas is committed to meeting the focus of this committee by growing a skilled workforce to fill family supporting careers and jobs that benefit the nation's security, bolster the state and local economies, and fulfill a rapidly growing demand to electrify our economy. Thank you for the opportunity to be with today, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Evans. Uh, and now Mr. Zish. Uh, Mr. Zish serves as the head of the Mining Engineering Department at the Colorado School of Mines. He is also has 40 years, or over 40 years, of experience in the mining industry, including international mining, mining plant operation, and numerous corporate assignments with various mining companies. Mr. Zish. Chairman Hickenlooper, Ranking Member Braun, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today on the growing importance of our critical minerals workforce. With over 40 years of experience in the global mining industry, I have seen firsthand the sector's significant contributions to the economy, local communities, and living standards. Critical minerals are essential to produce medicines, semiconductors, defense systems, clean energy, and more. I have also seen examples of the lasting damage mining can have on communities and ecosystems. This conflicting realities complicate perceptions of an industry that is vital to our economy, energy future, and national security. I know that when it comes to critical minerals in the modern world, the most important critical resource is our people. Skilled professionals and stewards of natural resources trained to solve complex engineering and social challenges. For this reason, I returned to mining education and now serve as the head of the Mining Engineering Department at Colorado School of Mines, the world's top-ranked mineral and mining engineering school. Our interdisciplinary education and research cover the full mineral life cycle from exploration to reclamation. As global demand for critical minerals has surged, there is growing recognition that these goals will require more minerals and more mining. At the same time, it is estimated that half of the U.S. mining workforce, about 220,000 people, will retire by the end of the decade, and the talent pipeline is not sufficient to meet demand. Declining enrollments are a result of a combination of factors, including limited knowledge or experience with the industry, the globalization of mining operations, an industry image that associates mining with environmental concerns, as well as a perception of an unsafe workplace. In response, the university is promoting a new vision for the future of mining and responds to the scientific, social, and environmental challenges facing the sector and aligns with the student's passion for environmental stewardship. It also integrates innovation, advanced technologies, and sustainable practices to minimize environmental impact, optimize resource utilization, and increase productivity. We must demonstrate that careers in the minerals industry are rewarding and impactful. There are signs of an enrollment rebound at Colorado School of Mines. In fall 2023, undergraduate mining engineering enrollment increased by 22% from the prior year, with just over 100 students enrolled in the mining engineering program. With climate change at the forefront of many students' concerns, we work to inform students of the essential link between mining, minerals, responsible resource management, and sustainable energy, which appeals to their sense of purpose and drive to solve the world's most complex problems. Today, MINE's curriculum extends beyond geology and mine operations and includes classes in waste, water, and tailings management, and social and community engagement. Our mining department faculty also includes anthropologists, highlighting the need for technical and social awareness 
to understand projects in an environmental and societal context. Mines vision for future of mining also recognizes the transformational role of research and innovation, advanced technologies, robotics and AI, drilling innovations, advanced separations, tailings management, recycling, are all essential for an economically viable interest industry with a net positive impact for stakeholders. At its core, Mines research is rooted in partnerships with industry, national labs, academia, and government. Research is critical to address the most pressing mineral challenges and to the development and retention of mining and mineral educators that support and sustain mining engineering programs. Mining schools play an important role in growing our nation's critical mineral workforce through both education and research. Colorado School of Mines is committed to a new vision for mining in the future and working with industry, academia, communities, and government to reestablish our mineral workforce as a critical element of the U.S. economic, energy, and security future. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks to each of you for being here. It really is uh, uh, much appreciated. Um, I'll t ask some questions. I'll turn it over to Senator Braun and ask questions, then I'll probably ask more questions because I'm just naturally, being a geologist, naturally curious. Um, let me start, uh, Mr. Evans, let's lay a, a foundation for today's discussion. Um, this is a big deal, right? Making sure we have the workforce we need is, is of crucial importance and making sure that we don't have an ongoing reliance on foreign adversaries. Uh, what types of jobs that your com company needs now, or let's say as the mine opens, uh, let's say needs now or, or will need in the future, um, how do salaries in these jobs compare with other jobs that you're competing with in, in the state of Nevada? Thank you, Senator. Uh, our company requires skilled trades uh, to operate the plant, so welders, electricians, instrumentation techs uh, from an hourly standpoint. Uh, from a professional standpoint, it's a really a myriad. We have everything from metallurgists, chemical engineers, mechanical engineers, mining engineers, so highly technical jobs uh, that come out of the STEM field. Uh, the salaries that we offer in this, uh, in this field are quite competitive. They have to be. Uh, we're competing against other industries that are attracting STEM talent away, uh, so we have to pay well above average to get folks. The, the, uh, I guess the converse to that is that uh, we've had a lot of success being able to attract people, and I think you've heard it across sort of the theme here. We need to rebrand. Uh, I'm one of the oldest folks in the company and at, at 55. Uh, if you come to our laboratory and technical center in Reno, Nevada, or even out to Winnemucca, you're going to see some, some gray-haired folks there, uh, which is great because they have the experience to help train the younger folks. But by and large, our workforce is quite youthful and quite young, and they want to come into this field. They don't view it as mining necessarily or minerals extraction, but they see it as a burgeoning career area around the economy changing into a more uh, green economy or green energy. I think you and I spoke in the past. My daughter's a great example of that. She turned a job down with Goldman Sachs. She works at the National Renewable Energy Lab in Golden, Colorado. She wanted to go into a field that's growing, that's new, and have a front row seat uh, to where our economy is going over the next 20 or 30 years. A lot of our uh, employees that come either as interns or that we're working closely with the University of Nevada or Reno, or even more importantly, in closer term, Great Basin College, which is in Winnemucca, Nevada, are all thinking the same thing. As Senator Braun, you had mentioned, we actually go uh, and talk to kids in high school. We have a constant open house uh, every week, members of the public, we have school kids coming in and so forth. Um, and that's the same out in Winnemucca, Nevada, where we're actually outreaching kids in high school, bringing them through Great Basin College. They've actually worked to develop programs that are specialized around instrumentation, uh, around elect uh, electricians, which those are the, some of the two of the hardest to find. Uh, and they've already graduated two or three classes, and they're able to do that now in uh, a degree program, associate's degree, that's only a year versus two years. So it's possible, but it's tough. Um, and the other thing I'll add, too, is uh, rural economy, it's very difficult, too. It's much easier to get folks in, in Reno. Humboldt County, for, for the East Coast folks, is half the state of Connecticut has 16,000 people in it. So it's very rural, and typically when kids leave and they go to the state university, um, they don't come back. So uh, it's grabbing kids in high school so they don't leave, but it's also trying to, uh, to get people to come back to the area as well. Right, engage them in different ways. Um, taking that thread, uh, Mr. Zish and then Dr. Arnold, um, 
Can you talk about partnerships that, that you might have with community colleges uh, or apprenticeships and program with businesses as well? And what challenges do you expect as you try and scale up those programs or uh, see them being implemented in other places? So as far as the different programs that we have um, dispersed uh, away from we'll say the flagship at University Park. Uh, the, uh, Pennsylvania, Penn State has uh, Commonwealth campuses around the state and each of those has two year associate degree programs in things like uh, electromechanical engineering and those types of, of programs. So while our mining engineering program doesn't directly um, link with those, those are programs that Penn State has. Um, we need to do a better job of actually going out into uh, the community colleges and into some of the trade schools to actually uh, address the need for mining uh, programs, the need for folks to actually become uh, better, uh, better equipped to serve in mining positions, just to understand uh, the different environment that they're going into. Um, the second part of your question was uh, interacting with businesses. Uh, we have any number of uh, folks contacting us in the spring, in the summer, to come on to campus in the fall and to talk to our students, our mining students, directly. Um, they interview them often the next day. They tell them about their company one evening. They interview them for summer internships or full-time positions for the next summer. So by the time the end of the fall semester rolls around, uh, we have everyone placed. Um, some of them will actually change their mind. <laughs> <laughs> well, we all know kids. Um, they do that. But um, so the jobs are there, right. but we need more students to fill them. Got it. But on the critical let, let, minerals. Let me switch over to yes. uh, Mr. Zish just for a bit. We'll come back around. Absolutely. Thank you, Senator. Yes, the Colorado School of Mines also has programs where we have uh, relationships with uh, particularly three community uh, colleges which uh, provide opportunities for students to have then entrance into uh, School of Mines. So those are uh, working relationships that we have. Um, provides an opportunity for students to uh, get their kind of feet on the ground. It's a lower cost option for them as well. The other thing that we use a lot of those programs for is for, for targeting underrepresented uh, students coming into Mines. It's a great avenue for us to reach out to them and have them come through uh, which, what is a non-traditional approach sometimes, but it's been very effective um, on our underrepresented uh, opportunities. Great, thank you. I'm gonna step back, but I'm not through. Uh, uh, Graceland, I will be back to each of you actually. So um, I'm gonna turn it over to my co-chair, Senator Braun. It's because you're a geologist, right? You, you've got several rounds, so. Exactly. <laughs> so I'm an entrepreneur business owner and workforce has been a challenge in all areas. I mentioned that earlier. Depressing when you hear, did you say 12,000 was the number uh, from China? Yeah, and the I students think, enrolled, yeah. Yeah, and we were like, how many was that again? 162. I mean, that, that is unbelievable. Um, and then I think someone else mentioned, uh, might have been you, Dr. Baskerin, about uh, the stigma associated with, um, sadly, farming was in there too. And uh, that's the hardest small business that God ever created. And of course, that has gotten uh, more intensive with capital and uh, equipment and less labor intensive. That's the only way we keep up there. Then I think back, because I always like to get to the root of a problem. Um, when coal was our primary uh, mineral, that we were mining um, and using to generate electricity, I don't seem to remember issues getting people into the field. Uh, our neighboring county was the highest income county per capita in our state of Indiana, which is the biggest manufacturing state per capita now. And that's almost all gone. So how much of 
the skills you need for mining in general would have been because we had a vibrant coal industry back many years ago. And does that have anything to do with why we don't have as many kids interested in it? Because they seemed to be interested then because they were good paying jobs. Uh, whoever feels comfortable answering that, I'd like to get your opinion. I think globally we see a phenomena where young people, urbanization, I mean, there's just been a changing phenomena where people are moving to cities. So there was once a time, I think, at a height, the height of the mining boom, like the coal boom in the United States, but mining more broadly, where you kind of use place-based, right? You stay where you grew up and where there was that mining industry, you stayed there. But now we're just seeing a global trend where people are moving to cities, there's more attractive fields that have emerged in the last few decades in tech, um, remote work, all of these things. And these are really kind of shifting. To the second part now that's different then is mining now requires a lot more STEM skills than it used to. Because we used to use a rock blaster, like a person would go place the, bl the blast and blast it. Now it's done by an engineer you know, in a, in, a, in a different space. So the type of skills that's attracting is different and that's also gonna require um, more emphasis on STEM than it did before. So was it our policy that initiated you know, the fact that we pretty well said we don't want to use coal anymore. And I look at China where they're building all the green energy stuff and they're fueling it with fire or coal-fired plants building, uh, you hear, one a week uh, in terms of electric generation fueled by coal, India as well. Uh, how much of that, uh, and now that our policy has changed and you need the skills that are critical that you used to get, wasn't coal mining uh, a large percentage of our total mining that we used to do in the US? It seems like it had to be. Anybody wanna comment on that? Sure, I, I can take that question. Um, overall, we, have, we mine a lot of material and actually iron ore is the biggest, uh, well, I, is the biggest metal, metallic mineral that we mine, but we actually mine more aggregates than, than anything else. There's, a, there's this one. Um, and are they hurting for workforce too? Oh, everybody is. So, so everybody something is. has occurred to where anything that you're extracting out of the ground, uh, we just have been lagging on it. So it's kind of across the board. Mm -hmm. It's across the board, it absolutely is. So then that sounds like it's mostly going back to how we've maybe stigmatized. The reason farming, it's easy to explain. It's gotten to where you've been able to substitute uh, capital and equipment for labor, and we produce more. Here, you know, we've not been able to do that, and then it may get to be the nature of the job. And I'm guessing that issue is not the same in other countries, so... Um, Looks like until we get to the bottom of that, uh, we're gonna have a lot of trouble regardless of what we're trying to extract. It's very hard to open mines in the US, Senator. Uh, the ones that we had have declined. Uh, opening a new one takes a long time. It's hard to finance. And then the workforce is aged and you're left with a lot less people that you had before. And then one final question before I uh, give it back. How much has government policy been a factor in uh, making it more or less difficult? I'll answer you're, that. you're here with the government, so. Yes, sir. Uh, I think that the permitting process and the NEPA process is very rigorous and it needs to be. I, I, uh, going through the process ourselves, uh, the one area that I would look at for, for permit reform is, is judicial uh, in terms of uh, the length of amount of appeals. You've got, it took us four and a half years from start to finish to go through the whole process, and that's uh, supposedly short. Uh, we're both business folks. Um, it's hard to get people to lend you money or give you money when they don't know when they're gonna get a return on their investment. Uh, there's other mines in this country that have been locked in litigation for 15 or 20 years because new cases are brought after other ones are dismissed. Uh, so I think that's a, a, a key uh, port of at least the government portion around permitting reform, which it's more than just mines, as we know. It could be transmission lines, it could be everything. It, it's something we need to address for infrastructure in general in this country. Thank you. Uh, Senator Casey, the senior, Pensil senior, senior senator from Pennsylvania. Mr. Chairman, thanks very much. I want to thank 
<clears throat> both you and uh, Senator Braun for this opportunity to examine these issues. I'm going to thank each of our witnesses for being here. This is a busy hearing day, so everyone's in and out and moving around, so I'm sorry I missed your presentations. Dr. Arnold, I wanted to direct my, my uh, main question to you. Um, I don't think I have to explain to you or many in Pennsylvania um, what life was like um, a while back when we had a lot of communities that were suffering from the ravages of, of coal mining. Um, when I grew up in Scranton and still live there, the, the Lackawanna River was not what it is today. We were told to avoid it, don't go near it. It's dirty, it sometimes would turn uh, some form of orange, and, and now it's a place where uh, people come from far and wide to fish there. So it's been completely turned around. But we know of the, uh, the devastation of uh, abandoned, or the devastation that result, resulted in abandoned mine lands and all that came with it. We also know that in our state, we have a state constitutional provision which uh, Article 1, Section 27 of the Constitution mandates that uh, the people have a right to clean air, pure water, you know, the preservation of the natural, scenic, historic, and aesthetic values of the environment. It talks about each of us being trustees of the natural resources of the state. And so eventually the state took that seriously starting about 50, a little more than 50 years ago, it was more like 60 years ago now, and started to deal with this um, abandoned mine land problem and cleaning up the environment. We've got today more than 40 counties that are of our 67 that are somehow impacted by abandoned mine lands. And it's um, been devastating for the, the environment, the land, the community, the, the economic development that can occur when, when, that is, um, when that is not dealt with. I've worked on these issues a good while here and had some success, Senator Braun and I, uh, help work together to pass the Stream Act that allowed us to use, allow states to use a portion of their abandoned mine land money for acid mine drainage cleanup. And that was a good moment when we did that uh, because we had to fix a little defect in the infrastructure bill. Penn State and uh, leaders like Penn State and the National Energy Technology Lab in Pennsylvania are taking environmental re remediation one step further and they're pioneering ways to extract rare earth elements from acid mine drainage. I even visited Penn State and saw a demonstration. So that's a long lead up into maybe the broad question is what, what would you hope we could do here by way of new policy? But generally, what would you, what, what would you believe is uh, necessary to, to leverage which, what is a great workforce, an energy workforce in our state uh, to uh, take advantage of this opportunity that we have to actually take, take uh, extract from those, those uh, uh, in those communities, those rare earth elements. Well, Senator, uh, you absolutely uh, hit it on the head with what we're doing as far as recovering uh, rare earth elements and other critical minerals from acid mine drainage in the um, project that we're doing right now. To leverage workforce for that, uh, our energy workforce, I think it's going to be, um, it, it's actually going to be difficult because our energy workforce was actually, is actually aging. They're the 220,000 that are going to retire. Uh, and how do we bring new people into the pipeline? Mm -hmm. And that's, that's critical. Uh, we actually hide our minds. <laughs> we, we've um, made it to, we've got it to the point where you drive down the road and you don't know that there is a mine behind the hill. Um, now there are still in Eastern Pennsylvania, there are still comb banks and we still need to uh, address those. And we are, some of those fluidized bed combustor combustor plants are doing a, a job of recovering that, creating energy at the same time, and then putting that material back better. But we need to figure out how to get more people into that workforce as well. Um, you know, we can do everything we can on the automation side, and we are uh, introducing a lot of automation and control 
a lot of um, virtual types of technologies, but how can we actually um, get younger people to do that, to go into those careers? Um, it's, it's going to be a combination of uh, curriculum at, for K to 12, letting them know that all of these elements that we're trying to go after are, are crit there. They are critical to high tech jobs, mm -hmm. and so it, it that it does that message isn't getting out there. So I think it's a, a curriculum thing. I think it's also um, and and not necessarily just to go into mining engineering programs or mineral processing programs. It's to go into manufacturing. It's to go into energy. It's um, it's just a it's at this point it's it's difficult to get them to think that those jobs are actually environmental jobs. Mm -hmm. Well, you've given us a lot to think about and to, to uh, strategize about, but thanks very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Indeed, thank you. Um, Dr. Baskerin, um, it's estimated that uh, the critical minerals workforce will need double if we're gonna meet our energy goals. Uh, some people say even higher than that. Um, I think many of our international partners have been working for a pretty good while building up their workforce. Um, what, what challenges have other countries faced in recruiting and retaining a skilled, robust workforce that can do what needs to be done? Um, and what are the, some of the best practices you've seen at work uh, in these other countries to address some of the challenges we've all been talking about? Thanks, Senator. I, I always think about Australia because it was probably about 15 or 20 years ago that Australia decided that they were going to be a mineral center of excellence. And when you look at Australia's economy, it's about 15% of GDP is mining because you have your inputs, your machinery, your production, your processing. Our DOD Title III DPA Title III grants actually go to Australian companies. But what they also did is they really aimed to build a robust workforce. So if you look at a lot of mining graduates abroad, they're Australian. And I think when we, a lot of that again is that prioritization of a long-term strategy that in many ways the US has lacked to developing that workforce. If I were to think about two things that I think about that we need to realize though with an Australian model of retention is people don't live at the mine. They fly you in and they fly you out. Right, and I think that's a big change over time is mines are not, you and I both know, mines are often not in exciting places, right? They're not the easiest places to attract it. And Australia's used other mechanisms in public health for to get doctors into places where there's Aboriginal health problems. They also have to use similar mechanisms. Is we need to acknowledge that mines are in hard places and we need to develop a system where there's two things. First, outreach is really important. Um, we've said a lot here, like young people don't know mining is a career, it's not a, industry that we think about. So first is going in and doing the outreach. Second is financially incentivizing it, not just from between the age of 17 and 22, your brain looks vastly different. When you're 22, you're thinking about how much money you need to make to pay your rent. When you're 17, you're not thinking about that. So it's actually going in and you know, scholarships, bursaries, co-ops, internships, experience, paid experience becomes super valuable. Um, and then I think the other thing is like, you know, we think a lot when we think about banking, like our friends who end, ended up in investment banking, they finished college, they went, they got their signing bonus. This information needs to be pulled forward so that we can, we can do that. And then the last thing I think is cross-pollination. So when I look at Australia, when I look at Canada, I looked at the top 12, sorry, Penn State was 13, so it's not in my numbers, apologies. But when I looked at the top 12 mine engineering programs, School of Mines is number one, and then we have four Canadian, four Australian, a couple British, Saudi, right? Is that actually we need to cross-pollinate knowledge better so that people see globally, like mining is big. I mean, I've been very fortunate to have an extremely international career. I spent all my 20s abroad, and that was mining, right? But that's not something I would have thought of when I was 17 or 18 years old. So bringing that ex exposure to the fact that mining is not living in West, rural West Virginia anymore is really important to changing that narrative. And I think Australia has gotten it right. They too are having an age, aging workforce. Canada has an aging workforce. This is a global dilemma. However, what we are seeing is if you put that architecture and plumbing into place, it's a gift that keeps on giving. I appreciate that. Um, 
And I would argue that the, I think many times mines are the most beautiful places. Um, and some of Wallace Stegner's novels, if you've ever read uh, Angle of Repose or even Crossing to Safety, they, they get into that a little bit um, further. Um, each of you, uh, in, in your distinct ways, are, are leading important efforts to, to move this, the, the critical minerals workforce forward. Um, can maybe each of you speak briefly about the policies that uh, you think Congress should support to help accelerate uh, this development of the workforce? Why don't we can start with you, Mr. Zishin, we'll go along this way. Yes, thank, you. thank you, Senator. I think certainly that some of the policies that should be out there need to get at and talk to this, um, actually Senator Braun's talked about the stigmatism and somehow incorporating um, the, these mining as part of the solution and part of the cont contribution to solving our energy issues. So I would think that policies that, that can help to deal with that stigmatism and the, and the industry perspective would be um, very helpful. I would also think that when from a standpoint of anything we can do to encourage the scholarships, internships, et cetera, um, would, be very, would be very helpful. Good point. Mr. Robbins? Yeah, um, my focus has been really local. Uh, mining is a, is a very local thing, and, and uh, they, are, they are in areas that are very rural, so focusing on uh, programs where the federal government can assist with local or uh, state or county governments with community colleges. I gave the example of Great Basin College. I was amazed to see what they put together on a shoestring, uh, basically in some cases with donations, uh, with some small grants, but if they had uh, more opportunities and more resources, I think they could do more. Uh, there's a, uh, number one, when, when younger kids, they, they want to leave, they don't come back, but there's also nothing for them. So if you can show them a path, you can start to identify that in high school, uh, not only trades uh, training, but also some of the more sophisticated, uh, whether it be around instrumentation. And then to the point which we've heard from the, the larger uh, universities as well from it, these jobs are technical. So the mining done by us is actually done by a coal company. That's another thing that we can do here is that you actually bring in allied industries that it's the same thing. We're doing surface mining. We're using North American Coal. It's a 120-year-old company out of Cleveland, Ohio that does uh, lignite mining and phosphate mining in the U.S. But the STEM students, they can go to Apple. They can go to others. We have a very sophisticated operation. I could run our control room from Reno, Nevada, 200 miles away, uh, bringing that where these industries are growing, they're developing. I think you need both. You need the professional uh, STEM folks, but also, it all starts local. The folks that are going to live every day around that facility, grow families there, and actually, hopefully, some folks come home. Dr. Baskin. So money makes the world move. And I think appropriations are really important because we have so many existing programs and mechanisms in place. But a lot of these were developed before, were not made fit for purpose for mining because they were not at a point, it was really what the last 15 years when we discovered minerals could be weaponized and we went into a panic to create more, I mean, maybe 15 years is generous, it might be like seven. So I mean, I think when I think about this, what I had kind of mentioned earlier was like our Fulbright program has expanded so many times and it's such a good way to get academics, pra practitioners, and students to move and cross-pollinate that information. National Science Foundation, I grew up in an academic household, always heard like programs fail or succeed on the basis of the amount of money they have available to be able to execute good teaching, good research, good learning. Um, and then the, the I think the third area I would, I would suggest again is appropriations to our US military academies for minerals. This is something we're working on at CSIS, is going these are our future executives, ambassadors, cabinet leaders, like, and they have fantastic STEM graduates. So making sure that we're giving exposure, I mean to all universities, but also to these militaries because they have, they will go on to be leaders and giving them the exposure when we did we, I spoke at something at West Point in February. The amount of interest that peaked that now we're doing subsequent events was really exciting for me. So I think we have the avenues, but sometimes we just need to increase the funding to allow, to make them fit for purpose. Got it. Um, Dr. Arnold? Certainly. So um, I, there is a Mining Schools Act that is uh, making its way through Congress. Uh, if we could get that passed, I think that would be fabulous. Um, 
And beyond that, I, I certainly uh, agree with what the other uh, witnesses have said. It's, it's a, um, expanding some of the things that we have directly and focusing them on mining. Um, we don't need to have essentially new programs, but making sure that mining is included in a lot of those. More of everything. You guys actually sound like a bunch of mayors and governors. That's what they always come in. <laughs> I just want more of everything. Um, Senator Braun, got more questions? A couple of fun facts. Uh, you said 15% of Australia's GDP mining. Uh, ours is currently 1.4%. In 1947, it was 23 I thought it would be more than that. 57, 23 67, it dipped to 1.4, popped back up to 2.1 in 1977. 1987, it's 1 1.5, and currently it's 1.4. Healthcare in 87 was about 6% of our GDP. Now it's 18%. So that shows you how economies change. What's the one thing, other than permitting, and like each of you, and do it fairly quickly, because then I want to go to the second question. What's the one thing the feds could do to make it better for the issues we're talking about? And then number two, when it comes to actually fixing workforce, to me it looks like that should be the solution of the states. And that's where education is, the bailiwick uh, of education it would be states and uh, most of your particular programs are there. Um, can that be done between states and their educational systems on correcting this? Second question, but number one, what is the most important thing the feds could do to make life easier? Start with Dr. Arnold. Well, the most important thing that uh, the federal government could do uh, would be to Oh my, this is, wasn't thinking we'd be getting a question like this, but how about um, actually um, making mining more prominent in the, the, all of the programs that we talk about? I mean, that it is important, just the importance of mining. Sounds like we ought to be doing better at that, especially when we're wanting to be so involved in uh, new ways of uh, energizing stuff that's gonna involve critical minerals. Uh, Dr. Baskerin. We need a coordinated strategy for how we're gonna do this at a national level. Right now, when I look at critical minerals, I think we counted recently, there were like 12 departments and agencies working on minerals. And ultimately, they each have a little bit of a different angle, DOD, DOE, um, state is actually you need a coordinated approach to workforce development that all of these entities can weigh in on because DOD needs are a little bit different from DOE needs in terms of the education required. Um, Department of Education is a great place to hold a pen on that. But there does need to be coordination between the government or we overlap mandates and we're not doing it efficiently. We discover these gaps. Department of Labor has grants that go to mining, but it doesn't overlap. Coordinated strategy, federal, one document, this is how the variant, we're gonna do this across agencies. I'll go back to the local level, uh, push trades. Uh, it, it, between the state and federal government, folks coming out of uh, high school now, you can make a choice. You can go to college, and get a four year degree, or you can go be a trades person. In general, trades uh, wages pay higher. Uh, so perhaps uh, some uh, grants or other incentives that the federal government, along with the state through facilities and so forth, can push that. Uh, to offer another choice to graduating seniors in high school, which is going to give them a career that they eventually can go on and start their own business with. Uh, we're going we're to have to build a lot of stuff. I mean, I, I look at things more holistically. There's not only mines, but plants. There's transmission lines. And we have a lack of skilled trades in this country. And those are the same people. Primarily, when I look at our 350 folks, you need those skilled trades. Not only to build, but to operate the facilities like this. Senator, I think one of the key issues is that there's going to be research funding is critical for mining in the future. And I think from a government standpoint, support of any research funding would be exceptional. And then I think we also need to remember, uh, at least conceptually, when we talk about mining, it's a very broad area. It's not just the mines. There's a lot of other things. Processing is certainly uh, essential with regard to critical minerals, rare earths, et cetera. 
and if we can take a look at doing something to help the establishment of processing facilities, that can be uh, quite helpful, I would think. But research is significant. And research would seem to be something maybe that would have to be coordinated broadly. But when, in my opinion, when it comes down, the successful industries that have addressed this, that would be larger parts of our economy, they're not waiting on this place to coordinate it. Uh, they're even not waiting on this place to pay for it since we're borrowing 30 cents on every dollar that we spend currently. So I think I'd maybe look for a different business partner there financially. Uh, most of them have finally put it together. Uh, and I'm going to cite a company that's a big one, Toyota, near where we live, went into a rural area and immediately got in business with their local school districts and then started initiating apprenticeships, uh, summer jobs, jobs after school. And they are a large employer in a rural area that was in the heart of coal country that's figured it out without any help from this place. So much of it, I've observed, business has expected our school systems to spit it out. You don't have the natural proclivity towards trades in the way it used to do when we were the number one manufacturing company. We've never been that large in the mining arena. My advice would be for the companies in this business, uh, don't wait on this place. Uh, get busy with where you are in the state you're involved with, and I think you can craft most of the solutions that we're talking about, and you'll get it done a lot more quickly. If the federal government keeps pushing for all of this and has not been very quick at permitting, has made it tough to mine generally, during, uh, due to their other policies, they better wise up. They can't have their cake and eat it too. We had a great discussion. Uh, that'll be all the questions I have, so. Great. Um, I, I just, and I just would, this is a more philosophical question that, because it is, uh, I think what Senator Braun described is that shift towards other priorities, which is healthcare in this case. That's a dramatic change. And certainly that's a reflection of some level of the affluence, uh, the success of our country, and that we can now do a lot more mining with less people. We can do a lot more farming with less people. So those show up as a smaller percentage of, of the workforce and the, and the jobs. But at a certain point, and I just ask your opinion, is that, is that swing, is there a, does that over, does the swing have a, uh, once it creates a momentum of contraction in these jobs, does it put us in a position of vulnerability? And I guess I think that's, I, that's what I've been hearing is that now, we're going to have to import an awful lot of these uh, workers if we want to build a mining infrastructure that is resilient and protects us from, uh, you know, being at the at the mercy of, in many cases, adversarial nations. Um, if we're going to have to import the workforce, at what point? How how uh, how do we b begin to counteract that? And I, I heard. I mean, I understand more. More money into, into research, more money into the, into the education system, uh, closer connection with business, uh, you know, the various incentives. Is that enough? I mean, is that, again, the pendulum is swinging and now we've contracted, now we're probably past the point where we, do, where we have the sufficient numbers, our education system, a workforce training system that provides the workers we need. We probably are, are significantly understated, and yet it's still contracting, right? It's not really expanding yet, if I'm right. How, does, how do you guys measure that? Or am I wrong? I'm happy to, it's a, just a philosophical point. Senator, I'll take, uh, take that question. I think from a standpoint of vulnerability, um, I think, I don't think you're wrong to start with, but I think part of the answer is actually technology, automation and technology. We should be able to run these mines with less people in the future. The things that are happening in Australia and other places where they're running remotely, I think is part of the answer. But that means we need to get these students um, coming, into the, coming into the universities that see automation technology and all as part of the solution and are going to come into mining to apply those technologies and that applied research 
because I think there's a lot of opportunities out there from automation, technology, uh, robotics, a, a lot of things going on. Here, here. I, I think uh, as well, I'll just kind of go to a higher level. I think the federal government and state governments, uh, those alliances, doing something like this, you need to build allies. So you need a bit of a, a stamp of approval from the federal and state government. This is important, mining and infrastructure. Uh, from there, I think companies are happy to partner, and we've started that already with local institutions, even funding some of that uh, at a local level with grants and so forth. But the environment needs to be enticing where private capital is going to come into this industry and actually fund all this. So big companies like Toyota come in, they speak to the state government, the county, they're welcomed, it's great, you cut ribbons. This is an industry which has a stigma right now, and it's difficult. Uh, a lot of folks uh, don't really want to come to your ribbon cutting, they don't really want to get it done. But uh, the, the goal is to have private capital fund all this. I mean, we're, we're a recipient of the ATVM program. It's hard to even get funding for stuff like this because of the unknowns, because of how much time it takes. And hopefully it's just temporary. So you have a rush of private capital in here. And then all those things that businesses can self-fund that themselves because it's in their own interest to do it. Thanks, Senator. It's a very philosophical question, so I think I'm going to go home and think about it for a bit. But I think there's a couple of quick points that jump out to me. So one is there's a balance also between public and private. I can appreciate that we can't spend our way out of everything. One of the models that's worked really well in a number of countries is the idea of a skills levy. So for example, South Africa, which there's many mining companies run by South African CEOs, they charge a 1% skills levy to mining companies that turns around and goes into a pot of money that essentially then funds all of, you know, building the pipeline um, and South African mining engineers are everywhere in the world. And I think a lot of that was because they took that capital and put it back in to kind of create a circular system. Um, I think what we don't want to get to a point, and my fear is this, and I'm probably not alone, but we see countries where there's a real workforce impediment, see brownfield and greenfield mine just dry up. Because especially in a place where you can't permit, and if you don't have the workforce development, you can't look. The U.S. has significant amounts of lithium. It is not a top lithium. It's not on the high end of a lithium because of these various barriers. So we as a U.S. government, if we want to be serious about, I don't know, catching up to, like, you know, our compared advantage, we need to, there's multiple work streams that need to push forward. But if we don't, we're going to choke ourselves off on the, on the mining front. Right here. Dr. Arnold. Certainly. Um, one of the other things, though, I think we need to be thinking about is grassroots. We need to get into the schools and make sure that they know about th the need for the workforce, that it is high tech. I mentioned that in my opening remarks. We, uh, in Pennsylvania, there is an opportunity uh, before next uh, June 30th or something like that to go in and, and actually address the STEM curriculum. It's actually called STEELS. There's more than just STEM. So I will be working with some of the uh, folks in our education department at Penn State to see if we can't get um, some of the mining, the minerals uh, information into the curriculum. And then, um, I forget who mentioned veterans, but or the military academies. Um, that's the next one of the other pieces is to go and talk to our veterans uh, department on campus to see if those students who have already chosen Penn State might not consider uh, a career in mining. So there's some grassroots things that I think we can all do uh, local um, because every it is local. So. Yeah, I guess you could say you could say all mining is local uh, to turn a phrase. Uh, you have anything else you want to, any points you would like to add? Good. Great. Again, thank you so much uh, to each of you. I know how busy you are, and I know it takes a lot of time to get here and to, you know, ramp up and be prepared. Um, but it adds value, and there's, you know, this gets captured on, on C-SPAN, and who knows where, what supermarket you'll be shopping and someone says, hey, aren't you, aren't you, Mr. Evans, didn't I see you? Why don't you have something to do with lithium? Um, anyway, thank you all. Appreciate that. That's going to end our hearing today. Uh, I'd like to thank our colleagues and, again, our panel, um, and uh, also anybody, the in-person viewers and anyone watching online. Um, uh, for any senators who wish to ask additional questions, questions for the record will be due in 10 business days 
So until June 26 at 5 p.m. The committee now stands adjourned. <laughs>